the leading edge in the fight against growing old. And aging slower than the average 10 year old. Turning back the clock in ways we can measure, the promise for the future astounding. I see most chronic diseases absolutely gone. They say they're gaining years. But what does it take to defy the march of time, and is it an option for you? Ioana Miliotis breaks down the answers. It's a new era in aging, where the fountain of youth is less of a fantasy and more a promising reality. Mice are getting younger in labs. New drugs seem to stop the clock. The future seems ageless. But here in California, Brian Johnson is out to prove that future is already here, and he's it. If you imagine how we're going to live in 20 years from now, that's what I'm doing today. Buckle up, because what the 46-year-old tech tycoon is doing is out there. Johnson is spending $2 million a year to be 18 again. That includes blood transfusions from his teenage son and being hungry all the time. And nope, it's not crazy, he says. Quite the opposite. And so in this moment in 2023, what is the genius move for the human race? What is a thing we can't see? And in my estimation, it's something just so, it's like, dead simple right in front of our face, choose existence. Existence, as far as he's concerned, there's no real end to it. Johnson gave us a tour of his modernist home equipped with a state-of-the-art clinic. So this is a blueprint clinic. It changes all the time. Like you'd put this on your arm and like stamp it out. It tells the genes to behave uh, in a more youthful state. This is where a team of 30 experts are conducting his one-man experiment. Johnson calls it a blueprint for the rest of us. A blueprint is an open scientific question of where are we with the fountain of youth. And to do that, I've become the most measured person in human history. And we use all this data about my body. We look at all the scientific evidence. We design a protocol to say we want to maximally slow my speed of aging and reverse aging damage. And then we share everything with everyone. 1.8, so even better than last time. And he is a sharer, especially online. It's uh, 5.30 right now. He wakes up at 5.30 a.m. after going to bed at 8.30. This is just a very small demonstration. That Check out his water. pantry. Not a cookie in sight. And I would take these roughly 64 pills. That's for just for the morning? That's just the morning. Johnson takes a ton of supplements, eats mostly grains and vegetables, and his last meal is before noon. Keeping your leg straight. He powers through daily exercises, yeah, I just don't look at the red light directly. And does a lot of skin treatments. None of it looks like fun. But he says he's never felt better. And he is proving age is just a number. Or in his case, a bunch of them. Where are you at with your age, your biological age? My heart is 37. My diaphragm is 18. My left ear is 64. So some of my biological ages are in great shape. Some are not. We're not in a situation where we've reversed my biological age by decades. But if you're looking at my DNA methylation patterns, which you cannot see the naked eye, that's telling you that I'm aging slower than the average 10 year old. What does that mean in terms of lifespan or health span? Okay, let's just say science allows me to age slower so that I get September, October, November, December for free. And so the key thing is you want to slow your speed of aging because as we move to the future, you could probably do better and better and better and better until we get to the point where one year of time passes and I stay the same age. Okay, I think it's great. Thank you. Okay, we have to admit, our heads were spinning a little after the interview. But we wondered, what can Johnson's extreme experiment and his data teach the rest of us who, like us, still enjoy the occasional burger? We took that question to Dr. Leroy Hood, who lives in Seattle. Hood is pushing 85, but his biological age is 70, thanks in part to 200 push-ups and 100 sit-ups daily. The vigorous exercise keeps the renowned biologist young in mind and body. And that's good, because Hood says he's still got a lot of work to do. How do you feel knowing that you've taken that many years off your chronological age? You know, I'm delighted, because I have a big project ahead of me that's going to take 15 to 20 years, so I'm going to be around to see the end of it. This gives you that idea. Oh, wow. That project is also about using data to transform health. What do you take? Okay. So, I mean... What don't you take? 
could take supplements too. It's part of a customized wellness plan based on his genetic risk profile. And he wants to design a healthcare system that does that for everyone. So really you're looking for signals or warning signs before they become too difficult to treat. That is exactly right. And we're utterly confident for most chronic diseases we'll be able to find those signals. So when you look at the future, where do you see chronic disease or cancer, or Alzheimer's, do you see them gone? When I look at the future, I see most chronic diseases absolutely gone. It's extraordinary. Hood's vision is all about keeping people healthy until they die of very old age. To do it, he needs a lot of data so he can build on the research he and his colleagues have already done. So these are cultures and tissue culture rooms and some things like that. In the last five years, Hood and his team have tracked the medical information of nearly 5,000 people. Using genetic and other high-tech diagnostics, they helped boost their health and minimize their risk of future disease by making data-driven, personalized adjustments to their diets and other lifestyle factors. In one case, Hood and his team found a warning signal that prompted a woman to push her doctors for a colonoscopy. Just as they started the colonoscopy, they ran into an enormous colon cancer. And the next day, she was in surgery and had it out just before it metastasized. You know, data-driven health there said, gee, there's this signal that is, something's really wrong, you've got to find out what it is. Hood's studies have found nearly 200 signals of early disease, and he wants to find tens of thousands more. It's why he now wants to collect health data on one million people and use machine learning or AI to sift through it all. Hood says that means we could all have personalized guidelines for healthier living in the near future. What it will give each of us is the ability for our health span, the number of years we live healthy, to equal our lifespan, which is the number of years we live. And the second thing it'll do is give most of us a guarantee we'll live with health spans out into the 90s or even into the hundreds. So you don't think it's a fantasy to imagine living to be 100 in good health? Not at all. And I only have 15 years to go, so we'll see. <laughs> in Hood's world, people could share their information on their phones. There are caveats. The data has to be protected. And more than anything, people have to be willing to share it. And that's what worries researchers at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario who question how representative any huge health data pool would actually be, because they haven't been able to pull it off. Just put it over top of your nose like we've got something. The team here is tracking 50,000 Canadians for 20 years for one of the world's most comprehensive studies on aging. Most of the participants are Caucasian, and that's typical of most health research. So we'd collect lots of clinical data, social data, psychological data, Parminder Reyna is running the study. He says recruiting racialized communities is tough. He thinks AI-driven personalized health care has incredible potential, but not if diversity is missing. Who's at risk of being left out? I think that's a very important question that we have to address as a society. We have indigenous populations in this country on whom we don't have a lot of data. Our immigration patterns are changing rapidly. And if those people don't participate in research, if we don't have good data on those individuals, our AI models are not going to be able to address the needs of those populations. Back in Venice Beach, the millionaire we came to meet isn't exactly hanging with the locals. He knows he's not the everyman, but Johnson says everyone can still learn something from his data. So how accessible is it though? Because what you're doing is pretty extreme. Yeah, I know what I'm doing is extreme and it's not accessible for most people. What I hope to achieve is with my data to be the evidence to say it's worth it. So for someone to look at me and say, you know what? I believe the data and I believe it is worth my time and attention to go after this. Even if I can't do all of it, I believe that the science is there to significantly extend our lifespans and, and be much more healthy. Do you want to live forever? Yeah. I want to have the option every day to live tomorrow. So, yo, aside from not having the millions or the mindset, frankly, to do this, did you walk?
walk away from this experience thinking this is a little odd? For sure. And at the same time, we also thought he was kind of human because he talked about growing up, eating a lot of junk food, being a workaholic, and his life now is so regimented. It doesn't look like fun. He says he's never felt better, and he does seem genuinely happier. He struck us as that. And when you look at what he's doing, it's extreme, but it's also based on the basics, on eating well, sleeping, exercise, and most of us are not going to do what he's doing, not to that extent, but most of us can probably improve on those fronts and in the process add years to our lives too. Joanna, thank you. Thank you. Next, Ukraine puts Russia on the defensive. We break down Ukraine's drone attacks, but are they effective? Next. Ukraine just gets bolder as it strikes back at its Russian invader on Russian soil. We are fighting on different level. They're spending a fortune on drones that are hard to detect. This is one of the keys to the ending this war. But beyond the fireworks, what's their real impact? Here's Briar Stewart to break down Ukraine's brash offensive and how it's forcing Russia to react. Drones are bringing the war home to Russia. In recent months, there's been a significant increase in the number of attacks. We track news alerts for what's going on in Russia, and even now as we're filming this, I'm getting messages about suspected drone attacks. Here's one. Explosion in the sky is drone intercepted by air defense in the Moscow region. Here's unverified video. Gunfire was aimed at the sky during a suspected drone attack in the Peskov region. But how much damage are these drones causing and what is Russia planning to do about them? Ukraine is usually tight-lipped when it comes to these attacks, but why are we seeing a surge now? Here's what we know. The drone attack started against Russia last year. One targeted the Angles Air Base in Saratov, Russia. Satellite pictures in December showed a number of strategic long-range bombers parked on the tarmac. And Russia said in the weeks that followed, Ukraine launched two separate drone strikes, killing at least six people. The key thing about drones is that they do give you that precision so that if you're attacking a particularly vulnerable target and you can hit it accurately, so if you've got something like fuel storage or gas storage or ammunition depots uh, or indeed aircraft parked on the runway, you only need a few pounds of explosive uh, and you can do a huge amount of damage. But it was an attack last May that really highlighted how vulnerable Russia can be. Two objects were seen flying straight towards the Kremlin, the very center of Vladimir Putin's grip on power. There was an explosion right above the Senate Palace. Russian officials say those drones were intercepted, but more have kept coming. One Russian media outlet says that since February 2022, there's been more than 500 drone attacks on the country. Debris has hit skyscrapers in Moscow. Airports have had to close their airspace several times. A train station in the Russian city of Kursk was hit last month. And about a week later, Russia saw its most widespread drone attack yet. Seven regions were targeted, including an airfield in Peskov. That's more than 600 kilometers from Ukraine and about 60 from Estonia's border. Russian officials said in that attack, four military transport planes were damaged. So what's Russia saying? Well, the Kremlin has vowed retribution and says it's looking to see where these drones are being launched from. One of the most prolific propagandists, a bombastic host by the name of Vladimir Solovyov, said that if the drones came from NATO, then nuclear weapons must be Russia's response. He also openly questioned how Russia is going to be able to handle an even more heavily armed Ukraine. Not surprisingly, President Putin is saying very little about this, but a couple of months ago, he did admit to a room full of military bloggers that the drones are a challenge for the country's defense systems because they're calibrated to detect missiles. Ну, 
There are reports that Ukraine even hit a Russian airfield with drones made of cardboard. So what does Ukraine say about these attacks? Well, not much. They don't normally take direct responsibility, but that seems to be changing. On social media, Ukraine's president Volodymyr Zelensky said the country was able to hit a target 700 kilometers away with a weapon produced domestically. We actually are capable of producing drones that can fly much farther than that. You know, triple, quadruple this distance. It's the only question whether actually we need to do it, right? Because there are a lot of targets which are much closer. Experts say we're seeing an increase in drone attacks now simply because Ukraine has ramped up production. That push began last summer, and by the fall it became very clear about the damage drones could cause. Kiev came under attack several times by Iranian-made kamikaze drones. This year, Ukraine plans to invest one and a half billion in drone production, and some of the drones are designed to fly in groups. This unverified video reportedly shows an attack on Crimea in August. Russia says 42 drones were used. Experts say when they're sent in large numbers like that, it's easier for at least a few of them to slip through Russia's air defense systems. So where does this all lead? There hasn't been major damage to any Russian city, nor have the attacks significantly affected Russia's military might. But it is forcing the country to beef up its air defense systems, and that may mean it will have to redeploy equipment stationed in Ukraine back to Russia. The country has also threatened retaliation, saying these strikes won't go unpunished. So it's possible there could be an escalation of attacks against Ukraine. The other unknown here is just how this changes the situation in Russia. There's obviously a psychological impact to coming under attack. Ukrainians know it well. They've been forced to live through air raid sirens and explosions. Ukrainian officials say Russians need to remember that their country is waging a violent war and launching drones is one way to remind them. Now, Breyer mentioned the use of cardboard drones. They're produced by a company in Australia, and Russia has accused that country of being drawn into the conflict. Next, an extraordinary find unearthed in Israel. Oh, my God. Whoa. Let's see the moment a piece of history is revealed in our moment. You're looking at quite the discovery. Four ancient Roman swords dating back 1,900 years. Now, they were found deep in a cave overlooking the Dead Sea. So the archaeologists were undoubtedly thrilled with the find. And tonight, their uncontainable excitement is our moment. Oh my God. During our survey, uh, we found in a small cave in the Judean desert a stash of four Roman swords inside a niche, very beautifully preserved. Oh. We started research the assemblage of uh, swords, and now we understand that the swords are from the second century CE. Probably they were uh, hidden in the cave by rebels, Jewish rebels, during the Bar Kokhva revolt. And we think that they were stolen from a Roman army unit or were collected from the battlefield by the Jewish rebels. Wow. So keep in mind, they weren't looking for those. They were in that cave studying one of those icicle-like uh, formations of stalactite when someone caught and, you know, out of the corner of their eye saw the, the weapon stash. So it was a pretty good find. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.